Okay, welcome back for another lecture on the subject matter, Law Enforcement, Operation, and Planning with Crime Mapping. In previous lecture, we discussed already the different classification of police operations as well as the principle of police operation. So, a continuation for that lecture, we are going to be talking about the operational procedure from Rule 4 until Rule 8. Okay? So, Rule 4 talks about pre-operational clearance. So, when we talk about pre-operational clearance, this is the first step before you conduct certain operation. Under the Rule 4, it states there that before a police unit will be conducting a police operation, they must first secure a clearance coming from their police commander. A formal letter must be written subject to the approval of the police commander in that specific unit. So let's say, for example, here in the municipality of Bayombong, a certain unit of the PNP will be conducting an operation. Before they will conduct operation, they must first secure the approval of their COP and then the uh, approved request for operation shall be forwarded to the operation division on that specific station. So that is the process because, uh, you know, when something goes wrong, uh, it's not just the unit who will be subjected to inquiry, but the whole agency or the whole station, specifically the COP, will be also included in investigation if something went wrong. There is no operation that will be conducted without the knowing of the COP in every station because that is the first procedure in the conduct of operation. Before a specific unit will conduct operation, whether that is a checkpoint, patrol, uh, raid, bypass, or whatsoever, they must first seek the approval of their police commander in that station. So that's the procedure. That's the first procedure that a certain unit must follow before he can legally conduct a certain type of operation. Okay? So that's rule four. Rule 5 talks about the inter-unit coordination. There are instances wherein a certain operation will be conducted in someone's jurisdiction. So even if the Philippine Constitution states that police officer is national in scope, there are still jurisdiction that must be respected with regards to police operation. So a certain police unit shall not conduct operation outside their jurisdiction without proper coordination because, you know, something might happen if there is no proper coordination. So we have witnessed a lot of incidents already wherein uh, police officer versus police officer uh, fired at each other because they lacked proper coordination or police officer and military had an encounter uh, because they lack proper coordination. To avoid that thing, the police organization must always respect the jurisdiction of their unit or the jurisdiction of their station and also the jurisdiction of other stations. So before a police unit can conduct an operation outside of his jurisdiction, there must be a proper coordination that must be conducted to the station or unit where the operation will be conducted is located. So for example, the police officer of Bayombong will be conducting an operation outside Bayombong. They will be apprehending a criminal in the jurisdiction of other municipalities such as Bambang or Solano, they must first coordinate with the police unit in that specific place before they can freely conduct their operation. So that is the procedure. Of course, there are instances wherein coordination is impossible, such as in cases of hot pursuit, wherein a criminal, while being apprehended, speed away, travel across the jurisdiction of Bayombong. They, they can still pursue that person even if they're already traveling in municipality of Bayombong has no longer jurisdiction because uh, that is where the national and scope 
of the PNP will apply. So they can continue to pursue that person. However, they must still coordinate with the unit that is located in that place informally. So if uh, you are already going to cross the boundary between Solano and Bayombong, then at least make some call, send some message that you are all going to be uh, crossing the jurisdiction while apprehending this individual. It can be done informally since the given situation does not permit a proper coordination that must be conducted. If uh, there is no way for the police officer who is in a hot pursuit operation to coordinate with the unit or with the police force that has jurisdiction over the place wherein this criminal uh, went to, then may, they can write an incident report or explanation later on. The priority is, of course, the apprehension of the criminal or the person who is being pursued. So those are the circumstances wherein the procedure with regards to inter-unit coordination can be disregarded for a moment, then later on it will be uh, followed again. So there are some other circumstances wherein this rule can be waived as long as the justification is valid. Okay, so that is with regards to Rule 5, Inter-Unit Coordination. Rule 6 talks about the basic requirements for operation. So a police officer or police unit who will be conducting an operation shall always see to it that they follow this rule, such as in the conduct of checkpoint, arrest, and any other type of operation. They must see to it that this will be followed. We have here, in the conduct of police operation, they must use a marked vehicle. So when we talk about marked vehicle, these are the government issued vehicle wherein the logo of the PNP can be seen and uh, you know the regular police car as, as we know that is a marked vehicle that we are talking about there are instances that they may be using some private vehicle and that goes with the exemptions but then as a procedure in every operation they must always use a marked vehicle the operation must also be led by a police commission officer. So uh, police commissioned officer refers to the uh, police officer who has the rank of inspector and above. For the new rank classification for PNP today, because they remodeled already, they renamed the different uh, rank of the PNP and that would be discussed on the separate discussion. But then uh, for those who are used to the old rank classification, PCO or police commission officer starts from inspector and above. So every operation must be led by at least an inspector and above. Also, it states there that in every operation, the personnel must wear the prescribed police uniform or attire. So there are instances wherein the operation will be conducted needs secrecy. We can consider that as, you know, depends on the requirements of that operation such as if you're going to be conducting a bypass operation and <laughs> if you're going to wear the police uniform, then it would be a bust. There are specific uniforms and attire for specific operations. So at least those things must be properly followed in every type of operation. So if the operation requires a police officer to be in civilian uniform, civilian attire, then be it, that's an attire. But if that is uh, like a uh, checkpoint, and other type of operations, at least all the personnel who will be conducting or who will be manning that operation shall be in a prescribed uniform, their police uniform. So that's with regards to the basic requirements of the conduct of police operation. Okay? The use of megaphones and similar instruments. So the use of megaphones and similar instrument is allowed in the conduct of police operation. That is to uh, give warning to whoever the, the operation is being conducted to, such as in hostage crisis. You need to have viable communication device with the uh, hostage and the hostage taker. So you may use megaphone. That is to give efficient and loud warning 
to the person who the operation will be conducted to. So it's allowed to use that. As long as the purpose of the use of megaphones and other types of communication device is for peacefully resolving the crisis that they're currently in, then that would be acceptable. Next is we have warning shot is prohibited. So in, in no case that a police officer is allowed to fire a warning shot in every types of police operation. They already prohibited the conduct of warning shot in every police operation because, you know, uh, the danger cannot justify the purpose of the conduct of police officer. Whenever you fire the firearm, you are endangering yourself or someone uh, already. So they already prohibited that and included that prohibition on the standard operation that must be done in every type of operation. So warning shot is prohibited. And let's move to rule seven. So rule seven talks about use of force in police operation. It says there that use of excessive force is prohibited. So in no case that a police officer who is conducting a police operation is allowed to use an excessive force. When we talk about excessive force, it refers to the types of act that may put life of another person into danger. What is allowed is to use reasonable force. So when we talk about excessive force and reasonable force, excessive force refers to the type of force applied that is already known as overkill. Reasonable force, that may be something that is done in order to just incapacitate the person a little for him to be captured or apprehended. In what instances we are allowed to use reasonable force are those circumstances wherein the subject is uncooperating, they are unruly, they, they put the life of the police officer or the other individual in danger. So if they pose threat or imminent danger to someone or to the police officer, then that is the only time that they are allowed to use reasonable force. Reasonable force, not excessive force. If you kill the person, if you kill the subject of operation, that is already excessive force. But if you pin down, wrestle the uh, subject of operation in order to put him in handcuff, then that is maybe reasonable. But then, if you hurt the person, making uh, him lose his life, or making him nearly lose his life, then that is already considered as an excessive force. So, excessive force is never allowed. Reasonable force is allowed in instances wherein the person subject to the operation is dangerous or he poses threat to the police officer or to somebody. So, uh, that is with regards to excessive force. Excessive force is never allowed in any conduct of police operation. There is no way you can justify the use of excessive force. You can justify reasonable force but not excessive force. Force. Use of verbal warning. So when we talk about verbal warning. So verbal warning refers to the words that are given by the police officer as a type of warning to a certain person whom he believes to be committing a crime or putting someone in danger. Before you are allowed to use force to someone, you must first make a verbal warning. So for example, you're going to subdue a certain person. Before you subdue him in any means you're capable, like if you want to pin him down or handcuff him, you first must make or issue a verbal warning. The verbal warning shall be in a language that is understandable by the person to whom the warning is being given. So let's say, for example, he is a foreigner so you must issue or make the verbal warning in an English or in a dialect or in a language that can be understood by that foreigner if you are going to subdue a local criminal so before you use force to that person you must first issue verbal warning 
Verbal warning includes you introduce your name, you state your name, you state your intention, and you state what do you want him to do and other instruction that you may give to the person who is being subjected to operation. So that is with regards to verbal warning. Okay, so what are the factors that can be considered in using reasonable force in the conduct of police operation? So, of course, the factor are the following. In cases wherein there is a confrontation between an armed criminal, between the police force, those are the only instances wherein uh, a use of firearm or a use of force, reasonable force, can be justified because we cannot afford sacrificing the life of the law enforcer while they are conducting or doing their duty to enforce the law. So in cases wherein the person to be apprehended, the subject of the operation is resisting or uh, he is posing threat to the police officer or to the public, those are the only circumstances wherein the use of reasonable force may be allowed. Other than those, use of reasonable force is no longer advisable. What are the factors that are considered in identifying whether the force applied is reasonable? So when we talk about the reasonableness of the force applied, it depends upon a lot of circumstances. So a police officer may, be, may encounter an instances wherein he is outnumbered. So when he is outnumbered, by all means, he may use reasonable force, he may draw his firearm in order to neutralize the situation. Other instances wherein the, the danger or threat is already imminent, then uh, maybe that's the time that uh, the use of force from the police officer will already be justified. There are instances wherein, in, in the current uh, trends that we are facing, we notice that there was a case wherein an ex-military personnel was shot to, to death by a police officer. So we are going to review what went wrong into that specific case. We can specifically say that there are some few errors based on the police operation that was conducted resulting to the death of the person. Of course, the first one, verbal warning was already given. So that's, uh, that, that is the proper. A verbal warning was already given to the victim while the police officer is pointing his firearm to that person. That is proper. But then when the victim acts as if he is going to get something from, from his uh, bag, he was shot by the police officer. So he was shot by the police officer based on the police manual that we have as we are reading it. The question is, is there already an imminent threat? By, by making an action as if you're going to get some from your bag, would that already be considered as an imminent threat? Even without yet confirming whether what, what is the item or object that the person is trying to get from his uh, bag, he was already shot. So that certain action raises different interpretation depending on which view you are using. But uh, if we're going to look into the manual, it says there that the actual threat must be there. In the view of the police officer who shot or who fired the firearm, maybe that action is already considered as imminent threat. But then, in the eyes of the uh, public, can you consider that as an imminent threat already. It is not yet sure whether a firearm will be taken from that bag or maybe an ID or wallet or a lot of things can, can, uh, can be happen. But uh, the point is that it's not yet clear whether what object will the person be taking out from that bag. And maybe uh, the police officer who fired the firearm is already convinced that the person will take a firearm from that bag. So he was shot twice. The first shot, maybe, can we say, reasonable. The second shot, 
is questionable. Why? Because, you see, the principle of the conduct of police operation states that you always respect the human rights of the person. See, if you intend to incapacitate the person only, then there's no need for a second shot. But then a second shot was made. So it raised several issues regarding that. Okay? So I'm just going to talk about the, the process, the actual process. We're not going to talk about the uh, planting of evidence or whatsoever because I think that is where they were, uh, that is where they were pinned down. These police officers involved were pinned down. I'm not saying this for the purpose to, to degrade any person or to, to claim that the victim is aggrieved. We're just talking about this to see or to relate the police operation procedure relative to that incident. There are a lot of uh, operations or there are a lot of incidents where we can observe sometimes that there are some few errors in the conduct of police operation and that is where the issues are raised. As I have stated, this issue can be viewed in different angles. So if you are on the side of the police officer, maybe there is no need for me to wait or to confirm whether he was actually pulling a firearm from his bag or not because it's already between life and death. And uh, the other side of the story is that you are not yet sure whether what object will be taken out from that bag. So again, depending on how we view the incident and uh, depending on what basis are we using in order to understand better the, sit the real situation was. Uh, many will claim that, you know, there's a difference between the actual event to what is written on the manual. They, they believe that the police officer is just doing his job and uh, what went wrong there is became it became sensationalized. Depending on how you view this incident, but for me, there are few errors in that operation itself. As I've stated, reasonable force. So there is a verbal warning before the force was applied, but then as the first shot made for the purpose of incapacitating the victim or was it made in order to for the victim to die so those are the things okay so that, that is with regards to police operation in in relation to reasonable force as i've said that the first shot may be reasonable but the second shot is already questionable so if you have second shot then maybe that's already for something okay so that topic will bridge us to the next discussion which talks about the responsibility of a police officer in charge of the operation so a police officer in charge of the police operation shall make sure that no life will be wasted okay so no threat or harm will be done to the subject of operation and specifically to their uh, part as a law enforcer and the public so that is the main priority of the person in charge as a person in charge of the operation make sure that no life will be wasted whether that's the life of the criminal the victim or the life of the enforcer that is the main priority now let's talk about rule 8 rule 8 talks about the use of firearm during operation when is a firearm allowed to be used in an operation so a firearm is allowed to be used in operation when the offender poses a threat or imminent danger to the public to the law enforcer or to the victim and another justification of use of firearm in whatever operation that is is based on the revised penal code of the philippines that that is with regards to justifying circumstances or what we call self-defense so as long as the action will fall under self-defense the use of reasonable force or the use of firearm will be valid will be justifiable so we always base that to the justifying circumstances present in the revised penal code that is self-defense uh, 
defense of a relative, defense of a stranger. So if someone's life is being put into imminent danger, actual danger, the use of force or even firearm is already justifiable for the law enforcer. Okay? So that is with regards to the use of firearms. The same is true with regards to firing at a moving vehicle. When will be the valid circumstances wherein a police officer may fire at someone in a, in a moving vehicle? So the same thing, if the offender poses an imminent threat or danger to the police officer or to someone, then that is the only time where the police officer may fire their firearm into a moving vehicle. And the basis is the concept of self-defense. If the action will fall on self-defense, then that is justifiable. However, before firing firearm to a moving vehicle, you must see to it that you take the surroundings and the circumstances into consideration. Because maybe you are acting in self-defense, however, by doing so, you endanger the life of others, then that is still considered as recklessness and you are still liable or punishable to that. So if you are firing into a moving vehicle, you must look into this parameter. What are those parameters? They are the intent of the suspect is to harm a police officer. There is an actual capability from the offender to harm anyone or anybody, even the police officer, meaning maybe they are armed, they, are, they possess firearm, they possess uh, any type of weapon that may harm the passenger or someone else from that vehicle or to someone. And the last is the accessibility and proximity of the police officer to the victim. Now, if uh, someone is in the vehicle together with, with the criminal by firing at the moving vehicle will put those passenger to danger then you must uh, not fire your firearm or if the firearm or if the vehicle was too far from the uh, police officer and uh, in case you fire you may miss and hit someone then those are the instances we're in uh, you must not yet fire your firearm to that vehicle. So those are the parameters that uh, a police officer shall take into consideration before pulling off the trigger. Next is we have filing an incident report after firing your firearm. As a police officer, in instances wherein you draw your fire firearm and fired at someone or uh, something, you must always make an incident report afterwards. So in case you came into an encounter and you are forced to fire your firearm, the procedure for that in every incident like that is to file an incident report in order to justify the action, your action of firing your firearm. Whether that is uh, legitimate operation or not. You must always file an incident report. Okay, last is the procedure after an armed confrontation. So after an armed confrontation, we have here the procedures that must be followed. The first one is secure the site of confrontation. This, this uh, procedure shall be followed immediately after the incident of uh, confrontation, armed confrontation. So after an armed confrontation, you must secure the site wherein the encounter was made for for investigation process and uh, for, for record filing. Take photographs, again, that is for preservation of evidence. Check whether there's still object or individuals who may pose danger to somebody in that place. If there are wounded individuals in the site of encounter, take them to the nearest hospital. Maybe they are enemy or uh, from the organization or just, you know, a bystander there. Uh, bring them immediately to hospital. In case there are casualties, make sure that the body of those who died in that incident shall not be moved until further crime scene investigation will be conducted. If there are individuals that were arrested in that encounter, you must bring them immediately to 
isolate them from the rest of the public because of course they pose harm to someone and uh, they can they continue to pose harm until they are already isolated from the community and we have also you must conduct a debriefing from all the personnels involved in the armed encounter because you know uh, this is the problem sometimes we're in they are being uh, psychologically traumatized and uh, those are the instances where it can happen to the personnel who were involved in the operation. So there, there must be a debriefing session for those who are involved in that incident. And of course, as an incident happened, armed encounter happened, you must file a report relative to that. And lastly, in relation to the briefing, uh, there must be a counseling that must be done to those personnel that were involved in the Incident. So uh, those are the different procedures that uh, a criminology student must know relative to the PNP operations. So in the next discussion, we will be talking about the patrol procedure. So that's it for today. See you next meeting.